My name is Graeme Hughes, and as a boy, I remember watching Michael Palin's Around the World in 80 Days. And I remember asking my mum, why does he go to every country? Why is he just going around the world? And she told me, you can't go to every country, Graeme, because that would be impossible. So years later, I kept this in my mind, this idea of doing a, st a Michael Palin style travel around the world where I don't fly and I continue around the countries. Anyway, so I kept this with me and I took it to a few different people. I took it to The Guardian, I took it to The Independent to do a blog around the world. I was going to be the first person to visit every, world, every country in the world without flying. And they told me the same thing. They told me it was impossible. Forget about it. So at that point, I thought about you know maybe doing something else with my life. But it always nagged away at me. And then when I was 29 years old, I was over in Australia on holiday. And I went to see Lonely Planet, the guidebook publishers. And I pitched this idea to them. And they were the first people to say, actually, that could be possible. And so on the 1st of January 2009, I set off across the River Plate from Argentina to Uruguay. And that became my first country, Uruguay. My plan was to make a beautiful sine, wa sine wave curve around the world, go up to Canada, over to Iceland, down through Europe, through Africa, then all the way up through the Middle East, and then over into um, Asia, and then around the Pacific Islands, and end in New Zealand. I thought it would take me 12 months, maybe 18. It ended up taking me four years. The journey started in South America, then I went up to the Caribbean. And that's where I hit my first snag, because you kind of think Caribbean, lots of islands quite close to each other, there'll be a ferry service or something. I got there and there wasn't, only between a couple of the islands, but I needed to get from Guyana to Trinidad, from Trinidad to Grenada, from Grenada to St. Vincent, to St. Vincent to Barbados, to St. Lucia, to St. Kitts, over to Antigua, and then to um, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, Cuba and the Bahamas, and there were hardly any ferry services. So what I was, had to do, I had to go down to the ports each day, wherever I was, and basically beg someone to take me on their cargo ship, banana boat, or sailboat. Eventually, I managed to get around all of the uh, countries of the Caribbean. The most difficult one to get into was Cuba. The reason being that Americans aren't allowed to go to Cuba, um, apparently, according to their own government, and even though I'm not, um, I'm not American, it still affected me um, as a lot of the sailboats in the area were American and they didn't want to go to Cuba in case they got into trouble. But I managed to find a guy who was heading off to uh, Fiji, he was from Indiana, and he wasn't coming back. Uh, so he said, climb aboard, Graham, I'll take you. So he took me from the Florida Keys over to um, Cuba, ticked Cuba off the list, that's my 34th country. Then I headed up to Canada, I got a cargo ship across the Atlantic to Iceland, and then down into Europe. Um, I, Europe is a dream for someone like me who likes to travel without flying because you can buy an interrail pass for a couple hundred quid and on that you can go pretty much to every country in Europe. And there's 50 countries in Europe, there's, there's a lot of them. A lot of little places like Angola and Liechtenstein and San Marino and things like that. They've all got seats on the UN, they're all count as countries. And so eventually I made it, this is, a, this, is, this is crossing the river in Guyana here in South America over there. This is a, a, a bus, not that I was on, but that crashed into the water. This is heading over into Suriname. Uh, which is my 12th country. For some reason, it's spelled Suriname. I don't know why. There's a few countries like that. Anyway, so then I hit Africa. And I've got, I'm actually on video saying, well, Europe was a breeze. It only took a few weeks to go to every country in Europe. Uh, Africa now, that's going to be more, more difficult. It might take me two or maybe three months. Uh, in the event, it took me about three years to actually get to every country in, in, in Africa for various reasons, which I'll come to in a bit. But essentially, I got around the, the Caribbean, and we're, we're running behind a little bit on the images here, but that's okay, we'll just let them run through. So this is, this is uh, oh, I hitched a ride on a cruise ship. That was quite cool for one night. Heads over to Mexico, there's Mexican, Mexico there. And um, yeah, so once I got into Africa, I headed down to Mauritania, or tried to, which is uh, just below Western Sahara. I got to the border, and in my guidebook it said, you can get a visa on the border. I said, like, great, okay, so turned up, like $20. Have a visa, please. And said, no, no, we're not giving out visas on the border anymore. I said, okay, where do I get a visa from? And they say, oh, Rabat in Morocco, 2,000 miles north of here. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I've got to go back through the Sahara Desert to get a visa and then come all the way back. And he said, yeah. So I did. I jumped on a bus, went all the way back to Rabat, where I'd just come from, got myself a visa, came all the way back down to the border in Mauritania, and uh, it took me about a week. 
And uh, you're not allowed to go across the border without um, an escort because you, there might be landmines and things. So I was in a, I just jumped into a Frenchman's van and he took me across the border. And um, I said to him, have you got a visa? He said, no, 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 no problem. Uh, you can get a visa on the border. I said, no, 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 I've just been all the way up to Rabat to get the visa. And I come all the way back down. And he said, no, no, they change the rules all the time. It'll be fine. <laughs> not only did he get a visa, it was $5 less than mine. So anyway, I ended up, um, this is Kosovo there. So the, just got to talk about the countries that I went to, it's a bit difficult to say what's a country and what's not these days. So what I did was said, okay, every member of the United Nations, which is fair enough, 193 countries now. And then I chose sort of places like uh, Palestine, Western Sahara, um, Kosovo, as you just saw, Vatican City, and Taiwan, which don't have seats on the UN, but are arguably countries. So this is just me uh, finishing off Europe here, up in Andorra, where it was very cold, and then down into Spain, where it was very hot. And then I come across into Morocco. Now, the biggest challenge at the beginning of my journey was getting to Ireland. Actually, the whole f f way through the journey was getting into Ireland. And eventually I got to Senegal, and I had to go across to the Cape Verde Islands, which are about two, 400 miles to the west of, of Senegal. And uh, I'm going to show you how I did it. So if you want to turn the sound up, so there's there's... It will come on in a second. This is the boat, this is a fisherman's boat that I took to Cape Verde. This is what happened. We're well underway on our probe. And we're in the middle of open ocean, as you can see. I saw a shark earlier. I saw a shark fin. And you can possibly see how much we're rocking about. I don't know how far we've gone or how close we are. All I know is that I'm soaking wet. I'm filthy. My face is sunburnt, my feet are sunburnt, the back of my hands are sunburnt. You'd be glad to know that I haven't been sick again and I'm keeping my cheery uh, disposition despite the fact that I'm absolutely shitting bricks. We're about 135 miles now from any kind of land. In the middle of the ocean, on a boat with 10 people who don't speak a word of English and everything's made of wood. We don't have a sail, or oars, or a radio. Well, here we are, Cape Verde. Come on, guys, take us in before the police come and arrest us. So now waiting for the police to get on board. If only we were coming. I don't want to film them because you know what coppers are like with being filmed. There's a copper and there's a there's a, an army guy. At this point, Graham's camera is confiscated. Esta manhã no Porto da Praia, uma embarcação clandestina com 10 passageiros da costa africana e um inglês. Os imigrantes dizem que apenas acompanharam o europeu, que diz ser um aventureiro e que não pretendem ficar no país. Nós não viemos para cá ficar. O inglês pediu-nos para acompanhá-lo, mas depois regressamos ao Senegal. Não viemos aqui para viver. Os 11 imigrantes já foram encaminhados à esquadra de Eugênio Lima para prestarem esclarecimento às autoridades. I was held for six days in a little tiny cell with the ten rather angry African fishermen. Um, eventually we got out and uh, we explained to them what we were doing and why I was turning up on a boat. And uh, I spent six weeks in Cape Verde altogether because uh, it was very difficult to get out because the, the fisherman's boat that I came on got impounded so I had to get out some other way. So a nice German guy called Milan came and rescued me on his sailboat from another island. Took me back to Africa and then I went through West Africa which is probably the most difficult and the most fun bit at the same time. Some of the, the things that I got on board, I went via motorbike and everything like this. Everything I got on was public transport. I didn't drive myself, I didn't ride my own motorbike, and I didn't hitchhike. It was stuff that I could pay for and get on. A lot of bush taxis. This is Nigeria. This is this is like Mad Max in Nigeria on the on the highways. This is the main road from Nigeria into Cameroon. It uh, looks like something from a Glastonbury festival there. Um, and then um, this guy's cracking up. <laughs> Brilliant. And then um, headed through West Africa, and that that went really really well. It didn't take me so long to get through there. I got to Gabon. I joined the Bwiti tribe where they 
they take this uh, hallucinogenic tree bark called a boga and they dance around and that was quite fun. So I spent a week with them. Uh, there's a guy there, he's, he's playing a little tune. That's me taking the hallucinogen. And this is what I hallucinated. Uh, and then... Um, <laughs> And then I headed over to Sao Tome and Principe, which is one of those little countries, a little island nation, no one's really heard of, but it's a nation. And I got there on a, on a, on a sailboat with this nice guy called Mark. And then I headed back to Africa and I headed down to Congo. And in Congo, lightning struck again and they decided to put me in jail for six days as well. This time, not on suspicion of people smuggling, this time they thought I was a spy because I look like James Bond. <laughs> anyway, so I, I managed to get out of that one as well. I'm a very fast talker so when, when, when I need to be. Uh, there's a little bit of help with the British Embassy there as well. Um, headed down into, into southern Africa now, so there's some of the difficult countries to get to, like Angola. Then up for the east coast very, very quickly, heading over to Madagascar, knocking off Mauritius and, and uh, also Comoros Islands. I didn't get to go to Seychelles, though, because Seychelles is in the middle of the Somali pirate zone, and no one will take you there on a ship. So I thought, I'll leave that out and get back to it later. This is Egypt and then into Sudan. And this was basically finishing off Africa, but I had still had a, a couple more countries in Africa to visit, one of which was Eritrea, which was very difficult to get into. They call it the North Korea of Africa because all the borders are closed. But I managed to get there on a ship from Sa Saudi Arabia, which is quite impressive. This is Iraq here, uh, solo travelers. You'll have to be mad. That's what the guidebook says. Um, but I was in the northern area, the, the Kurdish region, which has been on, autonomous since 1991 and is fairly safe. Uh, this is heading over into, into Libya and Algeria, just to finish off Africa, and then up through the Caucasus, um, and then over the Caspian Sea into all the stands, which are Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, um, Kyrgyzstan, which is a different country, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Afghanistan, up there. Afghanistan, uh, was, was, I was there for about a day. Um, again, traveling on my own, just with my camera at arm's length. There I am outside the madrasa. Um, it was all right. It was quite nice. <laughs> we can say. Then I hit Iran. Iran was a real eye opener. One of the things that transformed my view of the world when I was doing this journey was Iran. It really was an amazing place. And I see this little old grandmother here. Uh, she was sitting behind me on, or in front of me, on an overnight bus uh, going from Shiraz to Khurram Shah on the Shat Arab waterway. And she was on a mobile phone and she's having a little talk on her phone. And she turns around, she, she smiles and waves to me, and I take the phone off her. Um, because he offers it to me. And um, I say hello on the other side, and, and the guy says, hello, my name is um, Saeed Hussein, and you're sitting behind my grandmother. And she's called me because she's concerned about you. And I said, well, why is she concerned? And he said, well, well, she says, the bus gets in very early tomorrow morning. She thinks you'll have nowhere to go, and, and, and no one will make you breakfast. So if it's okay with you, can she take you home with her so she can make you breakfast? <laughs> I was like, yes, oh. you know, this is a video game. It's like faith in humanity restored. Ding, you know, brilliant. So then I headed over to, through India. This is going up through Tibet over here, which is uh, kind of a, its own country. So, um, and then into down into China. Uh, you see me there on the Great Wall of China, and there's some dinosaurs there. Apparently they have dinosaurs in China. Uh, that was on the way to Mongolia. And then over to North Korea. I cheated a little bit for North Korea. I was in South Korea. I went to the demilitarized zone. They had these five huts that straddle the border between North and South. And it's so they can have meetings and they don't have to infringe on each other's t sovereign territory. So you, as a tourist, though, you're allowed to visit the hut and walk around the conference table. So I've been this far into North Korea. And then I came back. But I ticked it off the list anyway. So then I headed down through, this is the Philippines, uh, through Southeast Asia and uh, Indonesia. And then I hit um, um, Papua New Guinea. This took me two years to get this far. And then at the end of the second year, I got some really bad news from home. My sister had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So I was on the other side of the world. There was no way I could get back quickly unless I flew. So I flew back to the UK to be with my sister for a few months. And then um, I went back to Papua New Guinea afterwards to, to continue the journey. Before my sister passed away, she said to me, Graham, you've been to 185 countries. You've only got 17 left to go. Don't stop because of me. Keep going. So I did. And I hit, jump, hitched a ride on the Papuan Chief there and started my journey around the Pacific Islands, which is the most difficult part of the journey. It took me two years to get to this point. It took me two years to get to the last 17 countries because they're all islands and they're all very difficult to get to. There's me in Vanuatu getting eaten by cannibals. Managed to escape, which is great. And at this part of the journey, um, I had been, by the time I got to sort of Tuvalu, which is here, and then uh, this is the most critically endangered nation in the world, it's actually going underwater, which is a bit um, horrible. Um, and there's some kids having a play. That's me starting the ship. I used cargo ships to go around a lot of these 
um, islands in the Pacific, but it took a long time because they didn't go in a nice loop to every single country. I had to go back to Tuvalu a couple of times, I had to go back to Fiji a couple of times, I had to go back to the Solomon Islands in order to get around. That's the end of the third year, that's New Year there in Fiji. And this is the beginning of the fourth year, and this is me arriving in Tonga and getting to New Zealand, which you may remember from the beginning of the talk was supposed to be the end of the journey, but I still had seven countries left to go. I still had Nauru, I still had the Federated States of the Micronesia, Palau, the aforementioned Seychelles, the Maldives, uh, Sri Lanka, which I couldn't get to on the way there, and I also had South Sudan, which wasn't a country when I started traveling, but was now a country. So I had to go back. So I headed back through Australia, uh, managed to get to Nauru, managed to get to the Pacific Islands, and through to Sri Lanka, through to the Maldives, and then back to Africa. I got to South Africa and headed up through the middle of Africa, but basically through Zam uh, Zimbabwe, Zambia, all the way to South Sudan. And I've got to say, the journey transformed me. It changed the way I view the world, because if you look at the world through the eyes of the media, through the eyes of the news that you see, you don't see what's actually going on on the ground because you only see the high politics of what's happening. And it's wonderful to be able to think back now of these amazing incidents that happened in my life, not just the grandmother in Iran, but so many others and so many things that have transformed my life and the lives of people around me because I was staying with local people everywhere I went. So I'm coming up to the end of my video now. I've run over time a little bit, but this is my entrance into my final country, into South Sudan. So if you want to knock the sound up again, it should come on. Sound? Sudan, okay. the 201st and last country of the Odyssey expedition, which I've been on for the last three years, 10 months, and 26 days. And now it's over. I finish it in the newest country in the world. Boom! <laughs> Here's to South Sudan! Woo! I am now the first person in the world to visit every country without flying. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Woo! Right, now for sandwiches. Woo! Thank you. I, I, just, I just want to just quickly end by saying a lot of people here um, have got a passport, which is effectively an access all areas pass to the world. You can go anywhere if you want to, make new friends, meet new people. And I implore you, take it from a guy who's been to every country in the world, I didn't get anything stolen. I didn't get mugged, I didn't get beaten up. I didn't even get ill. So the world isn't a big scary place. It's there for, it's there for you to go and explore. You're only here once. If you can go, please just go. Thank you. <laughs>